welcome once again. And then uh, my name is Omar Lima. I'm a sommelier over in uh, Beverly Hills, Los Angeles at a restaurant, uh, Wolfgang Puck Spago. Um, and so I've been there slanging the juice and uh, we actually put on a good amount of uh, Alto Adige wines once I uh, got back from my tri trip in March. Um, alongside uh, two of the best in their game, too. It's uh, Tiffany out in Dallas, Texas, and then uh, my buddy Chris uh, at Illy in, uh, in New York. So uh, we all got a chance to travel um, to Alto Adige, stayed in Bolzano, um, and then uh, got to visit some amazing uh, wineries, walk some vineyards, um, and then, uh, you know, uh, very excited to come back and kind of preach the gospel of what's going on over there. And so Today's uh, panelist uh, I want to introduce. So we have uh, Armin Grautel, uh, Cantina Valle de As, uh, Izarco, uh, and then we have Letizia Passini um, and Colterencio, and uh, my buddy Harold over at Curtach, uh, Cantina Curtach over there. So I want to welcome the panelists as well. Um, and each one, the way it's going to go, again, courage to taste along uh, with the four wines that, that we have. Um, but we're also going to delve into a specific topic. But if you have questions, uh, we have the Q&A uh, down there. And then we, uh, I want some feedback as well from all the attendees that are tasting. Um, you can leave your comments in the chat as far as, uh, you know, what you feel about the wine. So we have some amazing uh, wines from each panelist. Um, and then uh, there's going to be tasting notes alongside, but you can do that on your own. Um, but we'll go straight deep into it. So I want to welcome all the panelists again, um, and I want to go into each one and specific. So we'll start, uh, you know, Harold. We can go with uh, with Harold as far as the co-op situation, how many members, and so forth. Yeah. Hello, everybody. Pleasure to be here. Um, yeah, I'm the expert manager of Cantina Kurtach. It's uh, one of the smallest uh, co-ops in Alto Adige, the southernmost co-op. We have 190 small-scale families, um, all together working on 190 hectares, so the same number. Uh, founded in 1900, a long time ago, and now led by a young team and with the aim to exploit the full potential we have of our vineyards ranging from 700 feet all the way up to 3,000 feet. Thank you. Uh, Letizia, what about uh, you? Hello. Yeah, hello, everybody. Thanks for joining. Uh, I'm Letizia Pazzini. I'm the expert manager at Colterenzo Winery. Um, I've been there since uh, 2010, and the winery is um, a relatively um, bigger um, winery. We have about 300 um, families, so 300 members. And we have about 300 hectares of vineyards, so making an average of one hectare per family or 2.5 acres. We were found in 1960 by 28 local growers back then. And throughout the years after, um, after that date, um, more and more joined the original group. The name is Colterenzo or Schreckbichl in German, and this is a name referring to the village where um, the headquarter is located and where it originally was started back in 1960. Beautiful, thank you. Armin. Hello to everybody. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. My name is Armin Gratl. I'm the managing director of uh, Cantina Valisarco. We are, uh, as Harald said, uh, he is the, uh, more in the south. Uh, we are the uh, northernmost uh, cooperative in Alto Adige and the smallest one. Uh, smallest means we have 130 families that grow 150 hectares. Also, our average is very small, but this is something which we have all more or less in common. So it's more or less uh, one hectare per family, uh, 1.2 in our case, um, founded in 1961. So we are the youngest, so smallest and youngest uh, winery up in the north in the Valle Isarco in Italian or Isaktal in German. So we got the name from the entire valley because our uh, families come from these 11 towns along the Isarco River, uh, very north, north in Alto Adige. And beautiful, I, beautiful. I will just add, uh, so for us, it's the same. Kurtach is a small, tiny town with 2,200 people um, in the south of Atuadige. So most likely when a co-op has the name of, uh, when a winery has the name of the town, it's most likely a cooperative winery in, in Atuadige. 
Fantastic, fantastic. So we'll get into the wines that we're uh, just to mention the wines that we're going to be, um, you know, tasting throughout this uh, this chat. So uh, first off, we have, uh, and you can go in either way. Nobody, uh, there's no rules as far as uh, what you want to drink um, first. So we have the uh, Val de Zarco, uh, the Kerner, 2021. We have the Kurtatskiava, 2021. Um, and then we have the Lagrand Classic uh, 2021. And also joining is the Tramin Gewurztraminer 2021 as well. Um, so you're free to taste as you wish. Um, but let's go delve deep into uh, the conversation. Um, so we'll have a, you know, first question for Letizia as far as the co-ops. Um, you know, when we have a conversation about co-ops in, in general, we, it's all almost in, most conversations and discussions, it's like a, a bad connotation or a bad word um, because what we think of co-ops uh, for the most part, I'm not saying everybody, but um, it's mass production and the quality of course goes uh, low when you have that. But what uh, what can you tell us about like the philosophy and history about uh, Alto Adige's and the co-ops? Yeah, um, so first of all, I think um, this has to do very much a lot with the traditions of Alto Adige and the morphology of the territory. As you can see by the pictures and the uh, photos passing by right now, Alto Adige is in mountainous region. So um, about 70% or more of the territory is covered by mountains and only 11% of the territory is arable. So this means that um, all the places to grow vineyards are very small and scattered around the territory here and there, most of the time on terraces, as you can see. Um, and uh, this, of course, has, has created over the years um, a way of having only small vineyards and small properties. But because of the mountainous region it is and the very lack of communication in road communication up until the 1970s. So the um, highway was only completed um, in the 1970s. People um, have a deeply rooted tradition in helping each other and um, collaborating each other. This was a necessity back in the days. So like uh, if you think about the 1800 when people was, were living up in the mountains, very high up and the, the only means of surviving was to share what they have, what they had cultivated in their lands. So this is the deeply rooted um, philosophy of cooperating with each other. And in fact, in Alto Adige, we have a lot of history on that, uh, including banks. So banking system in Alto Adige started off as a cooperative system as well. And next to it, wine, of course, production, apple production, etc. So first, this is um, the first link I want to give you um, towards history. The second link is again historic because um, Alto Adige has been part of Italy only since 1918, and um, this has created a very deeply rooted heritage um, of people that has always been have have always been living in Alto Adige for hundreds and hundreds of years, with a differentiation um, between Alto Adige and the rest of Italy, which is the language. So Alto Adige is 80 percent. Um, German mother tongue. And this has created also another um, way of keeping the people together and trying to really promote their own traditions. Um, so back in the days in um, the late 19, uh, 1800, um, I apologize, um, when the, most of the cooperatives started to be created in the wine business, giving uh, the possibility of all these families uh, to create uh, their own wines, even though they only had one hectare of vineyards, um, soon, sooner or later, all the cooperatives started to, to flourish. So from the late 1800 up to uh, the late 1900. And so was also called Terencio. In this perspective, at some point in the late 1970s, there were also some pioneering persons like Louis Reifer or Hans Terzer. So Louis Reifer was with Colterenzo, Hans Terzer is, was almost with um, um, Cantina Appiano, Eppen Winery. 
So they were um, pioneering leaders in the cooperatives of Alto Adige for promoting the quality. And um, so this is how today um, Alto Adige is um, set in, in the wine uh, scene. So with, um, with a different idea of what cooperatives are. So cooperatives are not as big as in other regions uh, in Italy or in Europe or in, a, in other parts of the world, but most of all, they have um, a social responsibility in Alto Adige because they promote um, this tradition of um, you know, keeping the mountain people alive, keeping the traditions of Alto Adige alive, keeping the families that have been owning the vineyards for hundreds of years within the same family. Amazing. Thank you. Thank you. Um, for the next panelist, I have a, there's a question that came up and, um, and Harold can uh, talk to, to this. Um, Hannah, we'll do, we'll talk, we'll ask the question and then I'll, I'll ask the, the question that Hannah had for Harold. Uh, uh, he can talk about that a little bit. So um, Harold, uh, for you. So lots of, and anybody who wants to, any of the panelists that want to also um, chime in and kind of put their stamp on it too. Um, with so many vineyards and plots, co-op members, how do you ensure quality? And can you tell us the quality and guidelines or pricing system you use mm -hmm. um, that either Kurtaj or that, you know, every, every uh, cantina has the structure mm -hmm. or guidelines that you need to go with? Yeah, sure. So um, to understand why oh, why we're able to produce uh, such a quality, you have to understand the framework uh, the co-ops in Alto Adige are working on, um, is based on. And that's uh, definitely, there are three very important points. Um, one is that um, the fruit of all the members, the whole 100% of the fruit, they have to deliver to the to the co-op. So you cannot say uh, this year um, the weather was really nice, so I um, sell my sell it to another private estate, uh, the, the, the grapes, and uh, next year perhaps uh, I, I sell 100%. So that's a very important thing to ensure uh, the, the the top quality they can get every every grape um, every year. The second thing is that um, for us in, in Alto Adige, every member has got one vote, no, no matter the size of the member. So it can be that somebody has five, six hectares, another has only zero point, like two and a half acres, one hectare or, or much less. But it's important that on the reunion, when the, the big uh, general reunion is done, and the very important uh, decisions has to be um, the, the taken, everyone has only one vote. Um, so it's a very democratic system. And uh, and then another important fact is that one, if somebody is entering the co-op, um, they pay an entrance fee. And it's not like in a stock exchange where um, if you want to go out for the co-op, you take your sum you paid and you get everything back. That's not the case. Uh, I know to Adige, um, you get back about the third of the fee. The fee is usually about five to 10,000 euro uh, in as far as I know in Alto Adige per hectare. Um, so that's also a very, very important factor that the members are stable. And um, so that's, that's the, the, the framework. And to um, point out the, the, the quality guidelines, uh, like we are working, for example, uh, like we have, of course, we have an agronomist. We do um, a regular reunion in the in the vineyards itself to discuss the uh, topics uh, which, which are um, important at that moment. Um, the winemaker itself um, is very close to with the agronomist and the member itself all the time. And the um the it's very important that the oh, uh, that the that the that the members um know why uh, they are doing the work, the effort. So in our case, the members know in which wine their grapes end up. Um and they know that um for example they have to follow our rules uh, in order to get the maximum output of the work. For example, um, if, if, if they want to plant a new vineyard, theoretically, they can plant whatever they want. But in fact, uh, they ask then ask, what, what can I plant? Because only then they're able to get the maximum output of, of the money. And regarding the payment system itself, in our case, um, we our agronomist evaluates 
each plot um, of each of our members uh, two times per year after the flowering and before the harvest. And this um, and he evaluates different criteria, for example, the canopy management, uh, the health status of the of, of, of the grape, of the plant, uh, the soil management, how it's been done. And this is combined with a sustainability concept where certain measures uh, are, um, are prohibited, for example, um, artificial fertilizers, um, insecticides, you can only spray the one which are, is obligatory <laughs> to, to, to spray uh, from the Italian Ministry of Agriculture, um, and the, um, um, what, um, so it's all a different complex, um, uh, and, and it's a complex system exactly, which uh, re relies on incentives. For example, yeah. if they do, do green seedings, they get um, a bigger score, and this ends up then to the payment price to the farmers. And that this... takes me to a, a question that I have too, and then some people are also uh, uh, wondering as well. And each and uh, panels can talk to it with just a couple points uh, as far as uh, growing sustainability, organic, biodynamic. Uh, Harold, you talked about spraying and so forth. Um, do, are those guidelines? Or do certain cantinas do different, uh, you know, uh, farming practices that that you know? Or does it, is there a guideline, or is each one kind of doing their own thing? Um, they are all well. Um, they, they they can do each do can do, but most of them are bundled together under our um, consortio, which um, which which helps. Basically, which is a which is a consortium, which uh, or association, which helps the farmers and the winery. Uh, this has been done made in the in the uh, in the past, uh, but nowadays everybody is doing more or less independently. So they have their own agronomists um, who 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 uh, takes care, and they have all their different strategies. And the Alto Arige itself, it's very important to note that by two thousand thirty, they are. Um, and they want to to um, uh, have the whole Alto Adige viticultural uh, sort of, uh, area and all the white wine producers cert certified um, uh, sustainable. Yeah. Can, I, right can I jump? Do... Yeah. Sorry, can I jump in? Yeah, Absolutely. just to connect uh, um, with Harold. Yes, yeah, so there is this um, twenty thirty agenda that um, the consortium of Alto Adige, the DOC Alto Adige has been implemented. So there is a sort of, uh, sort of um, getting together for um, a better environment and some environment projects that will be um, mandatory, will be mandatory by 2030. So of course there is um, some, um, uh, some time in between for everybody to adopt. But um, I think then besides this, which will be mandatory from 2030, each individual winery will do their best to um, internally set their, their rules and their um, specific requirements among the families and the members. Beautiful, thank you. Um, so let's move on to Buddy Armin over here. So um, we're talking about co-ops, but then there's social responsibility um, as being a component of Altuadija's co-op system. Um, can you talk about this and also the system, the region? Um, how do you maintain that family structure? Um, it's one of the only places that I've gone to as far as uh, wine growing regions where the next generation actually wants to step up and come back, either if they left for studies, um, but they want to come back and uh, and continue on the legacy, um, but that sustainability, sustainability of that uh, social awareness of what's going on there, Harold, uh, Armin. Yeah, uh, maybe I uh, always I just because I read the the question of Hannah, uh, which was uh, obviously Harald was explaining exactly, and then now we speak about the the social uh, factor. Uh, she brought uh, the quality of the grapes that you purchase from growers. I think this is a very important thing to. To, to add, uh, we don't purchase any grapes from the growers. The growers are the owners. And this is also then the answer of, of the question you told me. So uh, you have to see that uh, Coop Alto Adige means that uh, the owners, they grow the Coop. Uh, we all here, we panelists, everybody who works in the cantina is employed by the owners. Obviously, the managing director, the winemaker, the agronomist, they have some, for some freedoms. They can work, obviously. But at the end of the day, everything which is left 
everything which uh, at the end of the balance sheet is left, it's given to them. So uh, we pay uh, the grapes. So the result of the cantina is the highness of the of the salary, let's say in that way, of the grapes. So uh, it's not that we purchase it. So for that reason, exactly for that reason, they follow exactly the rules because they understood. And this is also, I think, one key factor in Alto Adige. And this is also uh, now coming to your question to me, how, how um, yeah, we will bring that co-op system also in the future where uh, it's not... Yeah, 50, 100 years ago, it's, it was a little different at the time because people are raised, are born and raised uh, there and they stayed there and they, their parents, they told them, you have to go out and then do the work. But nowadays, obviously, this is not anymore how, how the world is, is going. Uh, people, as you said, that they're around in the world, they're going to study. And the only, um, yeah, or one of the major facts that they come back and they remain uh, at home to, to do that very hard work, because we mentioned it already. It's everything very steep. It's everything on hillside, not even more, more mountain than hills, <laughs> if you can see on my back. So... Um, we have to guarantee to them to build, uh, and this is, I think, one one key factor. We have to to build a very strong, um, uh, yeah, very strong brand uh, for our cantinas, but for the whole area. And we have to uh, to raise quality year by year in 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 doing a very sustainable way. Uh, and just if you you raise quality, uh, and if you get uh, to know, uh, if you get a brand, you can sell your wines at uh, a fair price. Let's say it in that way. And if you sell the wine in a fair price, and if you work very well in, at your cantina, you can pay, uh, let's say, very well the grapes. And if you pay them very well, uh, the people are willed to do that hard work. This is one one uh, point, obviously, which is always important because at the end of the day, if you do the whole work. If you can speak about passion, you can speak about uh, this is your home and 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 then so on. But at the end of the day, obviously, you have to have also uh, um, yeah some money to to get uh, paid those expenses. This is one thing. And then and then now, uh, especially a little deeper to your question, uh, as we are so small sized, uh, this is also a, a huge advantage compared to other areas. There are no other areas, at least for what I know in the world. Uh, which you have an uh, entire territory in so small parcelized families um they have to uh, to do um yeah or yeah to to be part of a co-op otherwise they couldn't uh they couldn't live obviously with two acres three acres you can't produce your own wine so you have the only chance is uh, this co-op system where you can deliver the grapes and then at the end of the day you get paid a very fair and, and at the end a high price for the grapes so um and yeah. just in doing that, just in doing that, in paying them very well, the grapes, they're willed to do this this very um, hard work in our mountains, uh, try to reach year by year higher qualities so that on the other hand side, the winemaker can produce the better wine and then uh, the marketing and the sales can uh, sell it very well for a fair, I, I like to use the, the word fair, not high price, for a fair price. And uh, then uh, obviously the return is that they get back uh, the money. And so uh, I think this is a very important fact, yeah. Amazing. It's actually a, non, a non-profit system, uh, how, how we work. And yeah, I think it's beautiful and motivates the, the employees the day, itself. Yes, at the end of the day, the COP uh, don't make any, any, um, any uh, there is nothing left. Uh, there is uh, no profit at the end because everything is paid to the, to the farmers year by year. Uh, it's not that there is a manager who, if the, the cantina is going very well, he takes it all, but everything which is left at the end of the year, obviously paid all expenses, it's it's given to the to the farmers. And I think this is also if, a very important thing. Yeah. Yeah. If, if I can jump in. Um, also, um, I think just to let people understand better our system. So um, members are they're like shareholders so it's just uh the, the differentiation is that this is a cooperative um but they have a word in the management as harald and arming was were emphasizing so this is very important because yes they get paid for the quality of the grapes they deliver but it's a it's a longer term relationship because usually once a member um gets part uh, into a cooperative, it stays forever for many, many generations. Most of the time, it's uh, 30 years, 40 years, 50 years and more. And um, they 
are um, stimulated by produce better quality grapes uh, because of a certain system that all co-ops have been putting in place. Uh, I was mentioning before about Louis Reifer back in the 19, late 1970s. He was the first one um, that realized uh, that um, co-ops needed to have a different name in the world and the co-ops of Alto Adige especially. So he really thought that the right way to go and produce a uh, high quality wine was to start in the vineyards. So he had a big um, discussion with everybody, both of the co-ops and also the privately owned companies. And Alois Lageder for the privately owned companies was another um, pioneer in this sense. They truly believed that um, the, the only way to put Alto Adige on the map was throughout quality. And, and that's why they started to establish this system of quality assessment um, for all the members so that the members could take out all the um, high volume pergola train system vines and replant them with Guglio train system vines, reduce the yielding very much so that the, the grapes could be more concentrated and with the aim of producing um, a much higher quality wines in the end. So this was the idea. Yeah, my, my uh, you know, when we were there, it was all about, at least to all of us, we had this conversation, it's about quality over quantity. Um, and everybody seemed, all the families that we visited in the wineries, um, it like they bought into it because it's kind of, you know, when one succeeds, the other one does as well. And it's more of that, kind of thing that we don't like in the United States, it's not really seen. So it's not a thing that, that it was shocking in the best way possible because it was refreshing to see that a co-op, something with this uh, mentality, this idea um, that actually does work. Cause we know other regions that, you know, for the, some parts I'm not going to mention, but like that they, it doesn't, it's not as successful. And if it is, you still, can see the difference of quality um, in each producer. While in Alto Adige, when I, uh, you know, I sell it at the restaurant a lot, and it's because it's, I, it's not. I'm taking a chance on it. I'm having somebody believe, like, hey, this Schiava is going to be amazing with this, like, you know, Branzino. That even though the flavors, it's just going to be fresh and vibrant, and have that. Or this Kerner, like, this is something that I'm, like, brings passion because of what I saw there. So I'm very happy and it's refreshing to see it um, in other places where it just isn't as successful. So uh, thank you. And then uh, let's get into the some of the wines that we're having or uh, varietals that we're having. And then each of you can uh, talk uh, to that. So we're having uh, a beautiful Kerner, Schiava and the Lagrain. Um, and then the, the questions for the panelists, uh, which areas in Alto Adige make uh, especially good growing sites or specific sites or uh, aspects uh, for each one. So we'll start with, uh, we can start with the Kerner first. Okay. Pardon. Yeah, Kerner um, is a cross, uh, it's a hybrid grape uh, for those who don't know. So it's a cross Riesling and Schiava. It was made in uh, 1929. And uh, I have to say it right away for sure in Alto Adige, not of the, uh, one of the most blended grape varietals. So it's a kind of niche product. Kerner you find mainly in Balesaco, the area where, where our cantina is located, but so also uh, nowadays a little outside of, of Balesaco. Uh, what's, what's the char char characteristic of a, of a vineyard, which uh, what matches very well with this grape is a very high altitude. So we need here altitudes which are uh, eight, yeah, in, in the best way, in the best thing uh, 700 meters and up, that would be 800 meters. And this is also the reason why you find it mainly in Valisarco because we are we have ma many high altitude vineyards. And why do we need these altitudes? Uh, because on these altitudes you have very light soils. So this is another characteristic that this very, at the other hand, a very vigorous grape varietal loves. Because if you plant Kerner, the same thing would be for Müller Thurgau on very low uh, low um, altitudes with very uh, vigorous soils. You get very big bunches, very big berries uh, because it's a very vigorous grape varietal. So high quantity, but on high quantity, as we know, you can produce high quality. So getting reduced the yield by nature, best thing is go in high altitude. So you have lighter soils, very gravelly soils. So you lower uh, the the uh, 
yeah, the yield by hectare or the plant. And so you get more concentration, more structure, and then you get out more this very uh, little bit more this, this Riesling character. So as higher you go, as more you get this Riesling character, these nice aromatics, nice fruits. And so for Kerner, for sure, the high altitudes uh, are, uh, or the areas with high altitudes are the, the best to plant it, yeah. Yeah, beautiful. I uh, remember this was like two weeks ago, I put a, it's actually your Kerner uh, on a tasting menu. Um, just for the aromatics. And then, uh, you know, I had people telling me the diners are guests that uh, reminded them of Gewürztraminer meets Riesling meets like they don't they couldn't explain it, but it was so fragrant, so aromatic. But at the same time, it had backbone and uh, it served a purpose for uh, this sashimi that we had um, because it still could cut and kind of clean up the, the job. So it was beautiful. Um, mm -hmm. And then uh, let's go with uh, the Schiava, Mr. Harold mm -hmm. Kretach. Yeah, this is um, our Schiava from Old Wines. That's why in the name it says Alte Reben, the German word for old wines. So it's the only really wine from old wines we have. With old, I mean wines which are 60 to 90 years old. Um, and in, in Kurtas, we have, a, of course, Schiava is, a, is a, the most historical uh, variety in Alto Arige. Um, it has a very big berries and very thin skins for many considered to be the lightest red variety in, in the world. And I think that is the very beauty of, of, of Schiava. And um, even in it's in this case, from our terroir line, so from our uh, top line, this Schiava, um, we focus on the strengths of the variety, which is the delicacy and the elegance. So we vinify just traditionally, short skin contact after the fermentation, uh, like short, short maturation time, and then we leave it on a large old uh, barrel, 6,000 liter barrel. Um, for, uh, for like a half a year and and then we model it and um yeah because you know there are many different expressions of schiava but we very we believe uh, that that it should it shouldn't be um it, it should explain what it is and the beautiness is, is, is in its elegancy and definitely drink it uh, with a little chill on it um around 56 uh, degrees um around that i think it's that when it shows really beautiful and um yeah is there a specific so, uh for skiaba is there a certain soil type or certain uh, uh elevation that it, it uh, does really well it, it, it depends a bit where you are in alto arija i mean skiaba is planted almost everywhere unless like not not to high locations it needs a warmer climate and very ventilated area uh, so for us uh, around 1000 feet um and where we are facing facing the the Adige valley like you see in my background um that's where you have a a, a, a perfect terroir. Wow, so it, uh, it it should be ventilated and it should be not not too hot like in the warm warmer sites we plant Melo and cap Cabernet Franc, Cabernet Sauvignon, and just above it, um, that's where Schiava and actually Lagrine, they have a similar similar uh, growing, uh, grow, optimal growing uh, area. Beautiful. Um, so then we're moving on to uh, the Lagrine Classic 2021. Beautiful wine. I'm a big fan. Um, and then after uh, we uh, Letitia goes through this, we can talk about um, Meg had a Meg Maker had a uh, question for all of you as far as uh, the pergola system, trellising, aggressively managing yield. Um, could this become a viable option uh, for canopy management? But we can get to that after uh, we taste this beautiful Lagrine. Cool. Um, yes. So Lagrine, this is our classic Lagrine. So Lagrine is one of the um, two indigenous red grapes we have in the region. And um, Lagrine genetically is linked with Teraldigo and with uh, from Trentino and with Refosco del Friuli, and um, actually the parents, uh, the four forefathers of uh, all these three wines are actually Syrah and Pinot Noir. So this makes sense in trying to explain um, Lagrine to people that are not familiar with Lagrine. 
um, because it's a um, mountain red wine. Of course, it's, uh, it's not um, wine that has um, a full body, even though sometimes it can have, uh, if we're using um, oak and we're leaving the wine aging for a long time. But um, the typicity of Lagrine, it's really the um, dark color in a way because the color of the grapes is very dark. So the skin of the grapes is thick and dark, uh, but has a nice amount of acidity. And you can, I always like to, um, to say that you can feel the mountains, you can feel the Alps and the Dolomites in the Lagrine. So you have the right amount of fruit, um, red, sometimes black fruit as well, but you have the acidity, refreshing acidity, and you have the um, minerality of the soil. Most of the Lagrines are grown in Greece. Part of our Lagrines are grown in Greece, which is the traditional classic area for growing Lagrine. Um, this is a combination um, sourced from different vineyards, including some of Greece, but most of the um, soil here is sand and clay, even though in Greece we have more um, porphyric uh, soil, which also gives a lot of character to this wine. Um, this is um, a wine to be um, consumed young, but also you can keep it easily for five years. Then if you go up to the next years, to the Reserva and to the crew uh, ones, uh, then uh, you can keep them definitely for 20 or more years. Um, and these, of course, these different versions will allow some oak aging and some bottle aging as well. But I think the beauty of this wine is also to serve slightly chilled, as Harald was saying, for the Schiava and, um, and just enjoying, enjoying it. It's traditionally back home here. It's enjoyed with game um, or with meat, absolutely, but also as a nice... Um, appealing glass of wine and um you know to start the dinner with beautiful um so uh we're kind of toning it down to running it um but we have this last one from tremine uh one of the more aromatics of of uh whites that i've had um so this is the gewurz um hopefully everybody and i want uh in the chat or the q a but mostly in the chat i want uh some opinions of what you think of the wines. The producers are here, so they want to see it as well. What do you think as far as uh, structure, aromatics? Not saying you have a favorite, um, but what, you know, sometimes it's the first time somebody's had a, a Lagrine or Schiava. Um, and will it work in the place where either you work or is it something that you're interested in uh, in the future? And I do guarantee these wines over deliver um, for the price point that you can find them at. Um, and hopefully you seek them out as well. Um, so we uh, have a panelist that had a question as far as, uh, uh, and this is to all the panelists to close this out. Uh, how do you control the quality of the grapes that you that are given to you, for example? Uh, do you have contracts? Is there a place? And what do you do specific checks? And what happens, at least for me, what happens uh, if the quality year after year from this grower isn't? I know that's a little like, ah, but uh, if the quality, like they do, they need to remind, get a little reminder that they need to up the either farming practices or so forth. Armin, start. Yeah, um, yeah. As I said, it obviously, if if they are not following our rules, uh, we have an agronomist uh, who is uh, outside uh, to try to get them uh, there where we want to have them. So at the end of the day um basically we try first to help them obviously if there is somebody who who don't follow our rules if if he because he is already a member uh, he has the right to deliver at the end of the day the the only thing we uh, or the only yeah, way to punish it to say it in in in, in uh, nice words uh, is uh, to pay um less uh, the grapes so with the with the price obviously you can control a lot but uh, that's the last thing we would like to do. The first thing is obviously together with the agronomist and the winemaker to bring the member uh, step by step back to the to the right road. 
and um, we don't we don't have uh, problems in that way because at the end of the day if you're part of, of the cope you are part of the team and you understand that you have to produce quality so i think i speak for everybody that this is not uh, one of our, our biggest problems uh, right now to have people that don't follow our rules because they and they understood or we we explain obviously things as harald uh, told you before we try to explain everything uh, we try to explain each rule we made we have a big book of guidelines we are very strict and uh, on that and uh, the, the major thing is that uh, it's a democracy so it, it's made together with them and so normally they follow it yeah beautiful uh, Letizia, uh, I, can... I have a question yeah. for you yes. Yes. Um, and this is uh, from uh, Lana one of our uh, attendees uh, given the reputation of the co-ops um, that may or may not uh, have the Alto Adige um, knowing that it's a small under the radar region what do you think are some of the major challenges in building awareness of quality and uniqueness? Uh, I'm not sure I understood correctly the word, um, the, the question. So, so it was what, it's basically, yeah. so Lano just wanted to know, uh, like, how do you keep the quality? Um, at, here, let's by see. being, by being very strict as arming was anticipating, um, um, by keeping the quality very strict, um, strictly um, carried on among the members. So I speak for Coltaranzio. We we did a mapping of all the vineyards um, about 30 years ago, and we have identified a certain uh, vineyards that were more prone towards quality, had more potential because of their aspect, because of their elevation, because of the grapes. Um, and uh, we have encouraged uh, the owners of these vineyards to, um, to work step by step together towards a better quality. And this is how we measure the quality, um, um, like every day, step by step, every year. So we know already which vineyards have the potential. We know already which members will be making more and more quality. And that's how we support our um, higher tier lines. So, so we have contracts, yes, we have, there are members of the, 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 the winery, members of the co-ops, but at the same time, they, um, they have uh, signed up with, with us in a way of building together um, a path towards quality and how we promote it. Um, we make sure that we promote the quality, like marketing wise, this was the question or yeah, Omar, yeah. the last one. Uh, yeah. So uh, right now, so a rephrasing uh, of the question, what challenges are, are there in overcoming the co-op mentality? Some consumers may and uh, may have and may have and also being smaller re of a region that is not so well known. So it's just the challenges of overcoming well, the quality. Yeah, I think, I think um, maybe 15 years ago, 20 years ago was kind of a challenge to uh, overcome the mentality of the co-ops. But um, nowadays, I mean, um, everybody knows Alto Adige um, in Italy, in Europe most of the time. Yes, in the international market markets, it's sometimes challenging because you have to explain right from the beginning this system of quality and uh, explain the territory, how it is, explain the fact that it's a mountainous region, a very small region, and this is very traditional for us. So it takes a little bit more effort and more words, but usually when we do explain um, the the history and the background people understand and most of all when they taste the wine they all agree with us <clears throat> and they understand what if, we speak about if i can bump in um just because it's the region itself and, and the wine the, the viticulture co-ops are so different because the region itself or the vineyards are so different um from alto Adige than in many other regions in italy or in europe so um just if, for example, if you look at my background there, you see uh, the flat of the valley and the flat of the valley, the, it's flat. And of course, those vineyards are not so suitable to make super great wines like in the steep slopes. So um, I think one of the big, big um, advantages of Alto Adige is that the vineyards 
have a very high uh, there are very high quality vineyards so because in the in the worst sides their apples are grown or other fruits but mainly apples and the average quality uh, of of vineyards is extremely high so we have the good luck that um, whether it's private wineries family wineries or or co-ops uh, we have a very homogeneous and quite a high quality standard in Alto Adige and this helps a lot for the reputation of the region of Alto Adige as something something we are proud of and something which is very important to to uh, for the image of of Alto Adige's wines fantastic yeah um I have a uh, one of our ambassadors, uh, Chris. Uh, uh, as far as the wines go, it says uh, he can say in real time the Kerner and the Lagrine are beautifully paired with uh, roast beef sandwiches and arugula and horseradish cream on ciabatta bread. Thank you, Chris. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, I think uh, if anybody has any other questions, you, if anybody's interested too, this is being recorded, so you can get a uh, you know if you uh, had to hop off or get to work or something, you can. Uh, find it here we'll email it to you um, but I do want to thank all the attendees for tuning in and then also uh, the panelists for taking the time and and speaking about something that uh, I think most wine nerds and everybody here um, kind of want to know and don't have the real uh, you know information or the person in front of them uh, that will give them the right answer of what's going on with co-ops and why Alto Adige is I think going to be even bigger in the states than it is um i know new york chicago boston dallas la uh san francisco but within that realm i think because it's such an approachable uh wine being the price point isn't crazy i think it should be more but uh uh but they're so food wine centric like that's what it belongs to there's freshness vibrancy um whether you have the kerner with the aromatics gewurztraminer um and it's so uh refreshing to see how the system works and it actually creates amazing wines that uh that kind of leave you uh in awe and like why wasn't i drinking this early like before mm -hmm. like it's it's one of those things so um does anybody uh, any of the panelists have anything they want to add before we uh, head out. Yeah, yeah. Actually, there's one thing I think it's very important to to mention and talking about co-ops. Um, having such a uh, five thousand um, small five thousand farmers in Alto Adige and five thousand seven hundred hectares. We as a co-op producing the seventy percent of 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 the grapes in Alto Adige of the wines. Um, we are necessarily. Um, for us, it's, it's very. We are very important to maintain the small scale family structure. So without that small scale, fam with, without um, a successful co-ops, those would disappear, and smaller uh, private primaries would get bigger and bigger. And I think it's uh, a big um, important fact for the whole structure in our farming structure in Alto Adige. Yeah? All right. Well, everyone, I want to thank everybody for tuning in. Again, you can follow uh, all the information, um, the other uh, chats that uh, Tiffany and Chris had uh, about different topics of Alto Adige. But you can uh, you can see on the screen, follow at Alto Adige Wines on uh, Instagram and then all the other media uh, areas, Facebook and so forth and Twitter. So uh, thanks again, everybody, all the panelists. Thank, thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So there were many up. other questions to answer, but sorry, we ran out of time. <laughs> yeah, we'll try to get them uh, emailed out. And... Okay. Perfect. That's good. All right. Thank, Thank, you. Thank you. Thank you, Omar. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you very much for everything. Bye. Cheers. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for everybody. Thank you.